obviously we're a, a, a big museum. We've got a lot of staff, and those staff are basically world experts in what they do. So we have people who know more about I don't know, paper, Japan, ceramics, all sorts of things than than many people in the world do. So and and that's you know that's why you exist partly to to sort of get that knowledge and be a, an expert and to inspire other people and so on. But we are a um, we're not an art museum. We're an art and design museum, which is which is quite an unusual combination actually. There's quite a lot of art museums and there's quite a lot of design type institutions they t tend to be called. Um, I mean there is the, the design museum in London but we do both so we've got all sorts of things where it crosses over into to things like um, theatre design and so forth and so on and so forth but at any one time there's a vast amount of activity going on in the museum all of which is potentially really really useful to somebody but you just don't, don't know who it is. So. It's a bit, a bit like if you've got a, um, I don't know, if you've got an interest and you live in a small town, you're not likely to bump into the person that you want. So if you put it on the web, though, you know, there are communities on the web that do have that interest. So you, it enables them to come together in a way that they couldn't without moving. Um, so and so on. So it's the same thing with us. So if, if, if we have these experts of data, nobody is going to have time. Well, they're not going to have time to see more than like one other important person who knows about that stuff in their working lives. So if you can get them to blog, even if it's only occasionally, then you can then, you've got this digital knowledge, that, this unit of digital knowledge in a, in a form that you can then pump out into other situations. So, so everything that we do in terms of, of, of creating things should be always thinking about what can you do with this digitally, because otherwise you're just locking it away and it's important for that moment and then it's gone again and then you're, it's a, it's, it's almost like another microsite. So if some, I mean, down to the level, if, if, if a curator can, you know, write a, an, an email about something that they're passionate about because it's not quite working, then they've got enough information in that email to write a blog post, basically. And, and anyone can take a shot. You know, you can get a shot done quite quickly for, uh, for the quality that you need in the blog. You can get one, you know, anyone that's working in the, as an assistant or a, a hired staff to take photos of things. So creating the raw material actually shouldn't be difficult, but it's surprising how how difficult that is as a concept. Now, obviously, we're an academic institution, so there is there are um, historic uh, cultures of, of academic excellence and so on that need to be overcome to some extent. But but I think it's a matter of context. So if if you are talking about a published paper, a published paper has got to be polished. It's got to be excellent. It's got to have correct references. It's got to be spelt right. It's got to be everything. And obviously, that, that you know it's embarrassing not to. And and that in that context, I think um, that's fine. In the context where you're on the blog, you're on Twitter and stuff, that's not the same context. That That is the same context of the conversation you have in the bar at the conference you went to before you wrote that paper. And so getting across to curators that digital is your friend, in fact, you do what you do, what other people do on Twitter and, and, and blogs and things, you do, but you do it physically at the moment. Whereas if you did it there, then that, in, that knowledge is instantly shared around the world. Now, clearly, you don't always want everyone to say what you think at random when you're in the bar, obviously, but, but, but nonetheless, those conversations are, are, are rich and interesting. And somewhere in between a full academic paper and just a, a bit, not so heavy, but a, a thoughtful blog post gives you something that is, is uniquely um, awesome, basically. And, and we've got a lot of it and we need more of it. Um, so once you've got that, all you've really then got is a load of raw material. So you've got lots of beautiful clothes and you've got loads of sort of gold and you've got some flour and stuff. But how do you actually make that into fantastic cakes and, 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 and wardrobes of clothing and so on? So, and that's where the digital, um, that's where getting digital to move around effectively comes into it. So our social collection site that went live uh, five years ago now, so it's quite a long time, that, the, the thing that went live to all intents and purposes is a website, effectively a search engine. Um, but what it really is, is, a, is an intensely powerful engine underneath it, which is essentially just feeding object records into a, into, a, um, into a database and then serving them up as an API that anything can build on. And that was, the real, that was the real achievement in creating search collections five years ago, was to create that API and establish it as the working model for pretty much all our stuff. In the meantime, we, we developed other things on it, but having that data engine at the core of, of your heart is, is, a, is an absolutely essential part of, of being able to scale and be reactive and um, be responsive and, and build things suddenly when you didn't know they were coming. So we're, we um, did a survey back in November of people who come into the museum uh, that there's a, there had been a, um, what's the word, a 
preconception that, that the type of users that we attract are not interested in using mobile phones inside a, inside a beautiful museum because it detracts from the beauty of the experience. And the, well, there can be some truth in that. The, the shot of people taking shots of people taking shots of the, of the Mona Lisa is an example. Actually, when you ask people, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to use their phones wherever they are because that's what they do in their life every single minute of the day. And so whilst you might wish to control the manage the overall experience of how do all the users interact and how do you establish a new form of etiquette that deals with phones in the same way that you had to deal with the cameras. It's not that you should stop them, it's just that you need to have a establish a, a, a bargain with them. It's like you can use your phone, do what you like, but don't just stand in front of the picture and take your phone when other people are waiting. It's, it's just basic manners basically. So if, if you've got all that, we did the survey anyway in November and Lo and behold, everyone takes their smartphone with them. In fact, more people amongst the survey sample took their smartphone than the national average, but the national average is high. Everyone takes their smartphone with them. Uh, quite a lot of them had tablets as well. Um, that was higher than the national average, but they don't take them with them. And those little sort of details are like, they tell you all sorts of things about how you should develop your service. But coming back to the galleries, inside the gallery, everyone wants, everyone wants to be able to do it on a, on a phone. They want Wi-Fi. They want to be able to plug it in because they don't want to pay for the battery charging and they don't want to run out. And they might not use a service because if they use it there, they can't get home on the bus later. So there's all sorts of interesting issues that it throws up. But, but when we did this survey, you know, beforehand people were saying, uh, our users don't like that. But our users just said, yes, we do. Yeah, we want that. In fact, more of our users want it than the general public. That's the thing. So it, it, was, it was interesting to do that. So if we've got all this, um, stuff. I suppose we then need to, to, to deliver it to them. So making uh, a mobile interactive map is what we've been working on for a while just so that we can put it in front of people. Uh, it's live at the moment. It's not live to the public but it's live in testing so it launched about a month ago and it launched in effectively a staff beta. So, um, And the reason for that is that they're obviously a, a critical uh, in that they have to deal with the reality of dealing with the public. Um, they can use it with the public, they can get user feedback, and then they can do our user testing for us, basically. So, um, but with a, an honest eye. There are some downsides to that, because obviously, as a, you know, I'm managing these developers who are building it, I'm not the audience. The, the developers are probably even, even less so, because they're, they're, you know, there's an emotional attachment to coding, and, and it, it can be quite heartbreaking when somebody doesn't like what you've spent ages building. So th there's all sorts of things like that. But, the visitor information staff, if somebody doesn't like something, they get all the hard work. They, they, they get the, the, the grumpy person in front of them. So if it doesn't work, they will tell you it doesn't work because they'll, they'll have to live with it. So, um, so they're a really good person to do that. And, and thankfully they like it and they can see it. But what the map basically does is it takes our data and it repurposes it in a useful form on the map. But now it, the the interesting bit is they're using SVG vector files. So the, the file download size of the entire map, of the graphics of the map is a couple of kilobytes, it's tiny. So it, it's a really efficient way to do it. Uh, and it's really obviously it needs to be efficient because it's going to be delivered over, you know, potentially ropey 3G systems of people's phones. But, but then what it does is because we've bothered to make our object records into JSON things that can be fed out via an API, and because we've done the same thing with the events, and because we've done the same thing with the shop products, if you say, right, okay, we've got some beautiful graphics, somebody's designed these graphics, we've gone around the building, we've made sure they're accurate, we've got the original plans out, we've, we've got them, we've made them into vectors so they're nice and smooth. But you could just type a load of information back in again, but that would just be madness because you've got all this information and not only that, but a curator wrote that information and it's absolutely singingly good. It's, a, it's the best information you're going to get on that object in the building. So, so all you need to do is find a way of putting it in there. So that's where the engine needs to exist. Uh, and so our, our job as the digital media team is to make sure we have a, a heart in the, in the middle of everything that just says, I don't care what system you're using, I don't care how, how you've got it, what standard it's in, give it to us, we'll get the data, we'll make it into something that the web uses. Because obviously, like, um, curators cataloging standards in collections, there's something called Spectrum, which is wi widely used across the world. In fact, it might even have been partly developed at the V&A, so, but it, it's, you know, as it should be, there is a system that uses all sorts of lookup tables that will be Getty and all sorts of different things. I'm never going to understand the breadth of that, but I don't need to because that's what collections people are experts in. The collections people are not experts in the web, obviously. They're experts in, in their collections and how to manage them. So we don't need to know that, we just need to know that their data is good and we have an excellent collections department and they are currently spending a lot of time making the licensing information really clear. So if it's 
free to use, it will, we can put it out as CC0 in effect, but only if they've done the work to make the data clean. So, so that's what they're good at and that's what they do. And then we talk to them all the time and we make an engine that says, right, give me your beautiful data, we'll turn it into a beautiful web deliverable data. And that's what the API engine is there for. It's to say, I don't even know what the, I don't even know what the customer demand is going to be for services yet because the customers will change their mind because they're fickle. Some new, new phone will come along that does something that we've never heard of, like the iPhone did, like the iPad did, like the BlackBerry did even before that. So all sorts of things exist. We won't be able to predict that. It will just occur and then we'll have to be able to deal with it. And the only way to deal with it quickly is to have our stuff in, in a way that can be delivered really fast to any new thing. So we could get a developer in and we have done more than once. So, okay, here's, here's our collection site. Do you know what? We need a mobile one. Make us a mobile site. And it took a developer a week to make the mobile site. And that was because the data is there. They just need to plug it in on the top. And, it, and, and that is essentially the, the, the beauty of the model. So it, it's scalable. So if, if 100 new curators are suddenly hired because of a grant, it doesn't have pretty much any effect on us at all. We just get a slightly bigger file coming out and we process it and it goes out and it just goes straight through the system. And, and the same with the events. If more events go on the system, they just go straight out. And if more shop products get updated, they get updated and they just flow through the system and that's that's infinitely scalable basically so well not infinitely actually but <laughs> much more scalable than doing it by hand